Hello and welcome to Build Cisco SD Access Lisp Fabric Episode 3. My name is Jerome Dolphin and today we'll be focused on the Catalyst Center design menu. In this episode we'll review the concepts behind Catalyst Center design menu and then we'll move into a product demonstration. If this happens to be the first video in the series that you're reviewing and you're wondering what the series is about, please go back and review episode one. In the Catalyst Center design menu, a network administrator needs to create a network hierarchy. A network hierarchy contains areas, buildings, and floors, and it represents the physical and logical layout of the networks that will be managed by Catalyst Center. As we'll see in future videos, an SD Access Fabric site starts at a level in the network hierarchy and is scoped to that starting level and all levels below the starting level. Usually, the SD Access Fabric site starts at an area or a building in the network hierarchy. If this is sounding foreign right now, then the demonstration that follows in a moment should clear up any confusion. Once our design hierarchy is defined, we can use it to contain servers that provide services to the network infrastructure. As an example, SD Access uses Radius heavily for 802.1x and MAB, and we may have different Radius servers in different buildings. So we build a hierarchy, and in building one, we map Radius Server 1, and in building two, we map Radius Server 2. There's also other services that are contained within the servers menu, NTP, DNS, TACX, and so on. Device credentials are also mapped to the network hierarchy. So we may have different usernames or SNMP credentials, depending on what level we're operating at in the network hierarchy. We'll also find that these credentials are used to automatically provision network infrastructure later through LAN automation, which we'll review in the next video. Finally, IP address pools can be reserved against levels, that means areas, buildings, and floors, in the network hierarchy. Those IP address pools can be used to provision SD access underlay and overlay services. Examples of underlay services include LAN automation, fabric wireless access points, and fabric extended nodes. Overlay services connect IPv4 and IPv6 endpoints into layer 3 virtual networks and optionally perform multicast routing within those virtual networks. Now if you have any questions about what's been presented in this video or what is shown in the demonstration that follows, you can head on over to SD Access Communities. I'll put the URL in the show notes. Feel free to ask a question there or please speak to a partner CX representative or sales representative. Now on to the demo. Starting with the Catalyst Center hamburger menu, we can browse to design network hierarchy. Here we can see that I've configured an area called AU. And then under that area, there is two buildings, ADL and SYD. And there is an area called MEL. And that area, MEL, Melbourne, contains two buildings where those buildings each have floors. As you see, we can add floors to buildings, or we can add buildings to areas, or we can add areas to areas, giving us a flexible framework to define our logical and physical layouts. And this layout is important because, as we'll see, different levels in the hierarchy define what settings are provisioned to what network devices and how our fabric sites are structured. Moving on to network settings, here we can choose to configure AAA servers for network device authentication and authorization. In most networks, that would be considered a best practice, but to keep this demonstration simple, we'll skip network AAA and the SD Access network devices that will be created later, once provisioned in a future video, will use locally defined credentials to authenticate and authorize administrative access. We will configure endpoint AAA servers. These will be used later in the SD Access fabric once configured, 
to authenticate and authorize wired endpoints connecting into SD Access Edge node switch ports and extended node switch ports. We'll select the ICE cluster that was integrated to Catalyst Center in the previous video. You can go back and watch the Catalyst Center to ICE episode if you need a refresher. We'll select one PSN as primary and another PSN as secondary and enter a radius shared secret. For this demonstration, I'll enter my lab NTP server one and NTP server two and then save. Note on the left hand side that the global level is selected. That means these server settings will be deployed to network devices that are managed by this Catalyst Center and reside at or below the global level. In other words, these settings flow down the network hierarchy. If I choose a hierarchy level other than global, then I receive this pop-up saying the server settings used at this level have been inherited from above, which is global in this case. And the server settings can be overwritten at this level and that the override will apply to this level and all levels below this level. I could, for example, select a different ICE PSN for the AU level, which is sometimes how larger networks are configured. Different PSNs might reside in different buildings or sites or cities or continents. Okay, I hope the server settings behavior is clear. We define servers. Those server settings flow down the hierarchy and they can be overridden at different levels as required. Let's leave these settings as they are and move on to device credentials. These credentials are used by Catalyst Center to log in to network devices, discover them, and then manage them. Again, we'll define credentials for global level, which means I want these credentials to be applied to my whole network, not a particular area or region in my network. We click Create Credentials and we'll add in the minimum necessary credentials in order to discover devices. First, we'll create some CLI credentials, net admin one in my network. Obviously, you use whatever credentials apply to your network. I'll fast forward through the next credential creations, but just to summarize, I will create a public SNMP community and a private SNMP community. And with these credentials defined, we'll be ready for the next video where we discover some LAN automation seed devices and then run LAN automation. LAN automation will need these credentials to exist so that it knows what username and passwords and SNMP communities to provision to factory default devices as they are onboarded into the LAN automation network. Next, we'll go to IP address pools. Here we see I've defined some global level pools, a 10 and a 172 for IPv4. In the demonstrations that follow, we'll stay with IPv4 to keep it simple. But I did put an IPv6 range here just to communicate that if necessary, IPv6 is also supported in the Catalyst Center framework and in the SD Access fabric. In the videos that follow, I'll be building a fabric site that starts at the MEL level. So let's browse to that level and reserve some subnets that will be used for the MEL SD Access fabric site. I'll start by reserving a pool. We give it a name, choose the global level parent pool, in this case 10, choose the subnet prefix slash 24, enter the subnet, Enter the default gateway for that subnet, which will be the Anycast gateway provisioned into the SD Access fabric, and enter our DHCP servers for the subnet, which will be provisioned as IP helper or DHCP relay addresses in the SD Access fabric. Here now we've defined one IP pool for use in a layer three virtual network in SD Access. And now I'll pause the video while I reserve some more pools and then come back and explain it. Okay, and now we're done. We've defined some pools for overlays, Corp VN, IoT VN, and multicast signaling. And then we've defined some pools for fabric services, extended nodes and fabric APs. There's also a pool for LAN automation. It has a type of LAN, and we'll be using that pool in the next video 
to onboard factory default switches through the LAN automation framework. Thanks for watching. See you on the next one.